All right, Michael Obra back here um, to talk about Margaret Atwood's um, Orcs and Crake. This is lecture five. Um, we're actually going to start um, just with uh, the last uh, section of chapter eight. I realized that I hadn't talked about it. So uh, chapter eight um, ends with the section Extinctathon. Um, to contextualize this again, to recap, um, Jimmy has gone to visit uh Craig at Watson Creek, he's there over the Thanksgiving break, um, and as they're hanging out one night, um, almost on a whim, Craig brings up uh, Extinctathon, right, on the last evening, and um, we find out that Craig has been playing this for the past 10 years, or 8 years, or however long it's been, um, if we assume they were about 14 when they started playing it. He's now a master. He's now a grand master. Um, and we learn that the way that Crake accesses the uh, Mad Adam grand master group is through a portal that he's created, which is based on the image of Oryx as a seven or eight year old girl. And this sort of takes Jimmy by surprise. He feels like um, he's been ambushed right? Um, it's something that he believes is part of him. Again, interesting to think about whether or not this is a very intentional choice on the part of Crake. Um, and I will kind of save that those thoughts to talk about in uh, the final lecture where we'll kind of go into um, looking at the book as a whole. These first uh, chunk of lectures really just to get a, uh, the overall summary section by section to sort of walk through it. So, we learn that the Grand Masters are actually somewhat responsible for all sorts of different uh, sort of bioterrorism things, including uh, engineering critters that will disrupt society, including eating up roads. Um, we end this section with finding out that Crake has these nightmares. Um, and I, and, and he, Crake doesn't remember them, but he has them. And I, I think the important part is the very last paragraph of this chapter, of this section, um, page 219. Uh, I'll just read the whole thing out. Uh, so Crake never remembered his dreams. It's Snowman that remembers them instead. Worse than remembers, he's immersed in them. He's he'd waiting. He's waiting through them, stuck in them. Every moment he's lived in the past few months, important, was dreamed first by Craig. No wonder Craig screams so much. I think this is a reference to Craig's guilt. Craig was dreaming about what would happen. Uh, sort of the eventual um, reality that would come from the work of the Grand Masters at Extinctathon, what would happen to humanity and society. And what I think Snowman is realizing is he is in the living reality of what Crake was only dreaming about. Um, and he sees it as awful. Okay, so now moving on to Chapter 9. Um, chapter 9 is a section that uh, picks up with Jimmy's sorry, Snowman's uh, movements towards paradise, where he's headed uh, in order to um, pick up a spray gun and some other supplies. So it starts with a section called Hike. Um, and this is interesting in that it's Snowman making his way across this battered uh, landscape, this wasteland, right? Um, and it's the first time we really get an idea of the carnage that must have happened um, in the wake of this disease. Um, and we know that it must have only been a matter of months because of what we got in the end of the last chapter. The past few months uh, was dreamed first by Craig. It hasn't been long. And we get a couple more indications of that here. Um, Jimmy starts to wonder more and more if he's not the only one left. Uh, I think he's sort of assumed up until this point he's the only human left, and eventually we'll find out why he has reason to believe that. Um, we get a very ominous note from Crake in this chapter, in, in a sort of flashback, a masterful foreshadowing. 
that Jimmy misses, um, and Snowman realizes now. Um, I believe it's page 223. Uh, Craig says, Suppose for the sake of argument, this civilization as we know it gets destroyed. Once it's flattened, it could never be rebuilt, because all of the available surface metals have already been mined, without which no Iron Age, no Bronze Age, no, st no Age of Steel, um, and all the rest of it. There's metals further down, but the advanced technology we need for extracting it would have been obliterated. It's page 223. Um, he goes on to explain that not only the technology, but also the knowledge would be gone, right? He says, quote, all it takes is the elimination of one generation, one generation of anything. Uh, he says, uh, you know, French speakers, um, Beatles, whatever, right? Um, break the link in time between one generation and the next, and it's game over. Again, this seems to be his master plan. You know, what would happen, he says, if you got rid of one full generation, that's it, game over. Um, and you have to kind of think about what's happening here, right? Um, one other thing that I, I think is fascinating, I just sort of recently realized this, is on page 224, and some of you may have noticed this when you were reading, um, he starts humming Winter Wonderland, walking in a winter wonderland. So the first important thing is, and here's another reference to global warming and climate change, is he says they used to recycle that in the malls every, every Christmas long after the last time it snowed. So it's, it hasn't snowed in a long, long time. So again, climate change hasn't snowed. And, and again, if we locate this to the eastern seaboard, um, New England, Hudson Bay area, somewhere in that proximity, the fact that it hasn't snowed is is fairly momentum. I mean, this isn't like, it, well, it hasn't snowed in Arizona, right? Um, and we get uh, some, the follow-up to that, some tune about playing pranks on a snowman before it gets mushed. Maybe he's not the abominable snowman after all. Maybe he's the other kind of snowman. The grinning dope set up as a joke and pushed down as an entertainment. Um, maybe that's the real him, the last homo sapiens, a white illusion of a man, here today, gone tomorrow. I mean, that sent a pretty interesting, um, albeit very pessimistic and sad, assessment. But I think a fair one. You know, Maybe that's all that he's there for. Um... He passes through the barricades. He talks about people fleeing um, and the elements left behind. I mean, almost like a, an archaeologist finding these things. Uh, the um, woman's hair ornament in the shape of a butterfly notebook with the pages soaked, things like that. And it's empty. Nothing's moving, right? Uh, we move on to rejuvenescence, right? So the former splendor is already in decay. Um, it says already the weeds are thick along the curbs. So again, not too much time has passed and we sort of begin to contextualize. It's probably only been a matter of three, four months, um, which is hard to discern at the beginning. It seems like it's been much longer than that. Um, everything is still relatively new. Uh, Jimmy breaks into a house, he finds a man in the bathroom, and we learn a lot more about the disease proper. Um, how absolutely horrific it was. Um, with bleeding eyes, right? Uh, he gathers up a handful of things, um, supplies that he's, he's picked up, um, he has some sort of flashback to his sort of voyeuristic nature of reading people's his journals, the journals of the girls that he uh, slept with in high school. Uh, we get some information about the people that lived in the house, uh, that they, uh, the man was a word man, obviously, um, and that there's a missing child, uh, or there was a child there, but there's no body for the child. And it, it's sort of this... Uh, at the end, page 233, it says, The back of his neck prickles again. Why does he have the feeling that it's his own house he's broken into, his own house from 25 years ago, himself the missing child? Um, you know, again, this idea of missing, gone, out of place, um, gap. Uh, and so really rejuvenescence, that, that section, I think, serves a purpose of 
really giving us a glimpse into what the disease was, what the landscape is like now, and then the lingering guilt. Um, okay. Um, twister, uh, the last section here. So there's a big twister, uncharacteristic, not just the normal storm that, that hits. Um, Jimmy takes shelter uh, inside a checkpoint. Um, we get the, a great man must rise to meet the challenges in his life, which is another reference to a self-help book. I don't know personally which one, but if you find it, uh, let me know. Um, we also get a reminder of Oryx there on her soft feathery wings. The, in, the interesting sort of importance of birds in this book throughout um, Oryx, or sorry, Oryx comes to him on wings, but really um, the redneck crake is a bird. Thickney, which was Jimmy's original name, that's a bird. We get birds, birds, birds through all throughout this. Um, interested to see if anybody else has a greater idea of what the birds and feathers represent in this. I do know that Atwood uh, is a proponent of birds and sort of um, uh, bird, uh, what you call it? Preservation, right? Preser preserving habitats for them. Um, and somewhere read, I wish I could f find the, the source for this, that um, if birds die, we die is kind of a, a thought that she had had or, or a statement. So I will look into that and see if I can find it um, and source it for the next lecture. Okay, we're doing okay on time. So we're going to go ahead and move on. To chapter 10, which begins with vulturizing. Um, vulturizing, of course, well, there's another bird reference, right? The vultures. But it's a reference in this case to uh, a girl that Jimmy dates after graduating from Martha Graham, this woman, Amanda Payne, who is a conceptual artist. Now, before we get too much of a tangent and try and find the meaning behind the name Amanda Payne, um, I'll just point out that. Um, Amanda Payne is a real person that won a raffle uh, as, or an auction, and, and Margaret Atwood had auctioned off the name uh, for the book for charity. So th this is not the only time that she's done it. She's done it before. Um, it's kind of a cool thing that speaks to uh, Atwood's um, own philanthropy, if you will, or raising um, uh, raising money or gaining garnering attention for causes. Um, but what's important is that Amanda Payne is from the Clevelands. She's a conceptual artist. And, and um, again, very much unlike Jimmy and her and Amanda Payne's uh, fellow roommates are also unlike Jimmy. They're from the Clevelands. He's not. Once again, Jimmy is the foreigner. He's the outsider. Uh, Amanda Payne is another broken artist, uh, artist who uses this process of vulturizing as a commentary on society. So she takes, uh, I believe it's uh, rotting meat, and uses the meat to f create words uh, over, over a large field. Vultures come in and she takes pictures from above. Um, you know, much could be said for the words that she chooses. Um, I believe it's guts is one, uh, the final one is love, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, whom, guts, there we go, and love are the ones we get, I think. The other important thing I think that we get here is um, that she thinks in pictures and that Jimmy gets a job based on his dissertation on self-help books, which leads him to working at A New You. Uh, he breaks up with Amanda Payne, and again, they see this this job as um, part of the problem, I think. They they see um, these types of improvement, you know, sort of plastic surgery type things as, um, as wrong or ethically wrong. So, so the, that relationship ends. He ends up lonely again at a new you in what he calls a sexual desert, uh, his own type of wasteland. Um, interestingly, he goes about, uh, various, uh, company meetings, uh, silently, he says, ripping, 
apart everyone within eyesight. Very unhappy guy. Um, depressed, disconnected, nobody to communicate with in his own wasteland, in the T.S. Eliot version of things, I think. Um, girlfriends become lovers, right? He's sort of sophistication. Uh, he... Um, he, they tell him uh, to grow up or never grow up, depending on what part of it we're looking at, which seems to be another reference to Peter Pan. Um, he has a talking toaster. I don't know. He Jimmy is toast, or Snowman is toast, as we know from earlier. Maybe it's a reference to that. Um, another one that I have yet to dig into a great deal, but perhaps you all can find something in that. Uh, the plebe lands become more dangerous, and... Uh, security gets tighter. Uh, we will go through the next two actually rather quickly. So the last two parts of chapter 10. Garage, um, which is largely exposition except for two important things, two or three important things. Craig and Jimmy get in touch again. Uh, we find out that Uncle Pete died suddenly of some sort of virus. Hmm, interesting. We've got viruses. We've got uh, the Craig's reference to wiping out a generation. We've got Extinctathon and the Grand Masters orchestrating these things. We know that Jimmy's, or sorry, Craig's mom died suddenly of a mysterious disease. Now Uncle Pete has died of a mysterious disease. Something to keep an eye on. Um, we get that there are more plagues, more famines, more floods, more insect or microbe or small animal outbreaks, more droughts, more chicken chip boy soldier wars in distant countries. It's page 253 to 254. And we get the detail of Oryx being found in a garage in San Francisco, perhaps having been held as a sex slave. If you remember back to Uncle N, he had mentioned at one point San Francisco as a lucky place for people to go if they've been well behaved. So very likely that that was the tra trajectory of Oryx, and we can kind of fill in the blanks there, even though Uncle Anne died and she was sent to Jack. At some point, that chain continued, and she ended up in San Francisco, as Uncle Anne had mentioned. Um, okay, so we'll continue on. So, Gripless is the next part. Uh... More interrogations by Corpse of Corpse. This one, uh, probably the central part, if we look at page 258. Uh, at 257, actually, at the bottom, I have riot seen Jimmy recognized for a movie remake of Frankenstein. That's not our first reference to Frankenstein either. Of course, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, a story in which Dr. Victor Frankenstein um, uh, takes matters into his own hands, plays God, and creates the monster. Um, and again, the alternate title for Frankenstein was um, a modern-day Prometheus, which very well could be a title, uh, an alternate title to Oryx and Cray Cray. Uh, Prometheus being uh, the, the myth of, of the, the guy that stole the fire from the gods, right? Playing God again. So... That's important, but what we get is he sees this Frankenstein reference while being interrogated by the Corpse of Corpse, and they eventually show him a video of his mother being executed by firing squad. Her last words, they turn the sound up suddenly, goodbye, remember killer, I love you, don't let me down. Um, the reference to killer, right? Uh, what could that be for? Very likely... Uh, authenticity, so she knows, but also liberation, freedom. Uh, again, we can kind of think of like what trajectory she's been on since she's left, uh, since she first left Jimmy and his father, right? Um, and this sort of the half a cup of demonstrations where we saw her. So she's sort of been on this ethical um, tour, I guess, right? Probably protesting all over the world wherever she's sent. Um, postcards from. Uh, on page 260, this interesting thing, 
the pain of the raw, torn places, the dangerous membranes where he'd wanged up against the great indifference of the universe. Great indifference of the universe. The universe doesn't care, right? Doesn't care about him. And again, we should dig into that more. Um, just something to point to. He tells himself to get a grip. Um, he, uh, again, um, Alex the Parrot comes up again, uh, right? Um... So there we go. Okay, so moving on. Let's see. I think we can get through the first part of chapter. Maybe we can get through all of chapter 11. We'll try and make it quick to, again to keep this under um, 30 minutes. I think we can do it. Um, we'll kind of do the, the light speed version. Pigoons, the first section of chapter 11. Um, starts with Jimmy having a dream, a nightmare. Of course, in the trajectory of things, if we look at the modern, this is Twister. So the Twister's happened, he's gone inside, he's in the, the security um, bunker, um, taking shelter from the storm and having this nightmare, um, which harkens back to uh, his childhood, right? Uh, so he's, so here it is then, the moment, this one, the one he's supposed to be living in, his head on a hard surface, his body crammed into a chair, he's one big spasm, that's him waking up. Um, takes a minute for him to place himself, um, he looks around, and of course, what does he see? He's stuck inside, knowing that the pagoons are, um, outside, trying to come in to get him. Right, the two biggest ones, two boars with, yes, sharp tusks, tusks move side by side to the door, bumping it with their shoulders. Right, so he's sort of trapped. And it ends with, so, he says out loud, what next? Honey, you're fucked. That's page 268. He's in trouble. Uh, that moves quickly into radio. Uh, after a period of blankness where he's not really registering, he realizes there's stairs scrambles up the stairs, knowing that the Pagoons do not climb stairs. Um, we get the, a look at what life was like again before the apocalypse, especially in this uh, guardhouse or bunker, whatever it is. He finds a radio um, here, a sort of uh, wind-up radio. He, uh, on the page, on page 273, rather, he, uh, towards the bottom it says, uh, he turns the dial to receive, receive, uh, he turns the dial, receive is what he'll try. <sighs> then, faintly, a man's voice, is anyone reading me? Anyone out there? Do you read me? Over. He finally has found somebody else. He's heard somebody else's voice. Um, I'm here, I'm here, he shouts back to receive nothing. Again, he's, like the rest of his life, he's struggling to communicate and he just can't. Um, the end of that, to page 274, he feels buoyant, elated almost. There are more possibilities now. More possibilities, right? So again, as we talked about in class, his relationship with the Quakers, should he stay with them or not? Does he need to go find his own kind? This is the first time he's realized that there might be, uh, might, there's evidence of other people, right? He's always sort of, even breaking into the house, um, a uh, couple sections back, anticipated that there might be other people. This is the first time he thinks there is. Or he has hard evidence that there is. Okay, uh, last section of chapter 11 is Rampart. Cuts his foot, uh, gathers up some materials to make his way towards paradise. Importantly, he sees smoke in the distance. Now, what's so important about smoke? Uh, and if we look, he gives us some reason why he's worried or concerned about it. On page 280, um, we had uh, some bits and pieces here. It says, over the top of the rampart wall, you can see something white, grayish, white, and cloud-like, but it's too low down to be a cloud. Also, it's the wrong shape. It's thin, like a wavering pillar. It must be near the seashore a few miles north of the Craker encampment, 
At first, he thinks it's mist, but mist doesn't rise in an isolated stem like that. It doesn't puff, no question now. It's smoke. And he goes through this thing, he says, Crickers often have a fire, but not, not this large, right? Um, could be the result of yesterday's storm, uh, or it might be that the crickers have disobeyed orders. Uh, but then I think one of the things he realizes is the smoke ha at the end, he says, it's just one calm. It hasn't spread. So I would say Jimmy's being a little bit dense here in that the smoke isn't coming from where the crickers would usually be. Right, it's several miles north. Um, they don't usually make fires this big, and it's rising in a column from one place and not spreading. Um, he has a vantage point now that he has never had before, which is why he may never have noticed smoke like this in the past. So I think that that's a logical thing as well. It's a sign too that there are other people out there, um, and what should probably worry him, and I think what will and does worry him uh, on some level, is that these other humans are very close to the Krakers. And um, as we sort of talked about in class, if there's one thing that's really a threat to the Krakers, it's not really the Pagoons or the Wolvogs or the Bobkins. Um, it's not really themselves. And it's not really Jimmy. It's other humans that could take advantage of them, that could enslave them, that could, um, you know, uh, harm them in some way. Okay, let's end there. Uh, this is essentially two lectures for today, back to back. Um, yeah, so in the next lecture, we'll start with 12, chapter 12, and probably get through the end of the book. Um, and finally, yeah, so it'll be 12, 13, 14, and 15. Um, and then I'll do maybe one or two more short lectures, shorter lectures that kind of take into account the larger themes of Oryx and Crake and raise some larger questions. I don't have answers for all these things, um, so um, some of it will be food for thought. All right, uh, have a good day.